Okay, so we're going to be working with CART this week in R. And so one of the things I've done is I've prepared a data set, Dominant Trees for California. And uh, feel free to use that one. Um, if you open it up, you'll see there's FIA plots. And what I did is uh, pulled out the dominant tree for each of the plots. And you'll see I've also got the annual precipitation and annual temperature pulled out so we have some response variables to play with. Sorry, uh, covariates. Okay, so um, in the lab, you'll see we've got the standard setup, and then we're going to do our part. Okay, so um, very similar to the other modeling methods. There's the equation that we're using. It's called our part. You will need to uh, load our part library and the caret library and install those if you need to. Um, okay, so it has the standard equation with the response variables and oops, the covariates and then your data. And we do need to specify class. So that tells our part that we want to do a classification tree as opposed to a regression tree because this will be categorical. Uh, creating the model is easy. Whoops, as long as I've actually loaded everything. There we go. And plotting it is a bit more interesting. So the default plot for trees um, does not tend to be very attractive, particularly when you add labels to it. it tends to cut things off. So you may need to play with the margins. In fact, I was playing with this one and it still isn't doing what I want. Yeah, it's still kind of messed up. So you can spend a lot of time trying to get these charts to work better or students have discovered this charting package for trees now you'll need to again install this because it's actually a separate library our part dot plot and then load it and then i think you're going to be much happier with these plots and i think i am as well <laughs> okay they just look nicer they're easier to produce so nice plots and uh, uh, feel free to use these for your assignment. Otherwise, you'll probably spend a fair bit of time trying to get the other ones to look good. Okay, so, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, you can visually inspect your models, right? When they're when they're this level of complexity, we can look and see, does this make sense? Um, here we've got our first split with uh, annual temperature greater than or equal to 135. If that is true, if it's hot, then we go over here to blue oak. Otherwise, we're gonna get um, a split, don't worry too much about this. Okay, that's the, um, not to worry about. Uh, if the annual temperature is greater than 86, then we go over here. If precipitation is less than 932, then we go over here. We've got Canyon Live Oak versus Doug Fir. Another split over here. So you can see it's splitting up based on annual temperature and precipitation. One of the nice things is you can not only use continuous variables for the splits, but you can use categorical. It's very flexible, um, but again, I think it's best used when you have categorical uh, response variables for your output. All right, now that we have nice looking charts, let's go ahead and take a look at the complexity metrics. Now, if you do the summary, you get everything. It's a pretty daunting pile of stuff. So uh, if you just do print CP, it gives you a summary, which is pretty cool. Okay, and the key things you're gonna get here is take a look at this table. Here's our relative error. Now remember this is one minus something that's like R squared. So one is bad. We actually want to have a lower value. Um, and take a look at the definitions for X error. It's cross-validation error. Our uh, card has its own built-in cross-validation and then standard deviation of the cross-validation. So we are looking for all these values to be small-ish. And over here, you'll see CP and N split. So this is the number of splits. In other words, this is just your data without really having a tree, no splits to it. Here it is with two, three, four, five. So as we increase the number of splits, the error goes down. Um, and the CP parameter is how you can use to control for that. So to control the complexity of the tree. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, like now, I think. Yeah, OK. So we use this special function called rpart.control 
to control the complexity of the tree, which you're definitely going to want to do. And there's the CP parameter. So if I go ahead and just run this, you'll see that we're creating this control structure. And then we go ahead and rerun our model and we pass in the control parameters as this control object. Everything else stays the same. We run that. Oops. Run that. There we go. Now we can do our summary. Okay. Whoops. Sorry. Should use print CP. And oh, look, we've got just one node. Well, that's just not very interesting. And in fact, if you try to uh, plot that, look, we got one node. Okay, now that's because of our CP parameter. If we go back up and we take a look here, you'll see that these are the values of CP here that are going to give us these number of different nodes. So in other words, if we take this one and we put that in there, and then we run our tree, Ta-da! So there's the tree at that level of complexity. Okay? So, in other words, as we reduce the values of CP here, we are going to get simpler trees. Okay? If I keep reducing it down, simpler trees. Now, similarly, if we increase, sorry, decrease the value of CP, then we're reducing the impact of the complexity on the optimization, and we can get more complex models. In fact, you can get really complex models that take, oops, a long time to draw. <laughs> okay? So I thinking this would be overfit. We're now modeling the residuals as opposed to the data. So, um, CP is really important, as is this summary. Now, this will be interesting when we print this. It's going to take a while. So here it's, it's shown, oh, that's not too bad, 107 splits, probably overfitting. There's our CP. Um, and we haven't really driven our, our square down very much. Um, now, picking the CP is a bit of a challenge. So if we take this back up, let's see, where's a good point to put it? Oh, let's put it right here. Looks like that'll be interesting. Okay, not too bad. Okay, now, the real issue is how do we pick CP? Now, there is also a mini split our minimum split value that you can put in there, and there's some other controls as well. These are the only two that I've really used. Um, I mostly use CP because it's a direct control of the complexity of the tree. And uh, there's a number of different ways that you can pick a CP value. I want to make sure all of you know that, that one of the key things you should be using is looking at the trees, thinking about the natural history of the species, and deciding is it overfitting or is it modeling correctly and that's really important and I know yeah, you can only do so much of that in one semester but out in your careers uh, when you become experts in the area of natural resources that you're working in and you're around other folks who are experts definitely use that as a measure because when you go on the web and you look for how to set CP you'll see people giving you formulas and different equations in fact there's a, a function called plot CP where you can just drop that in. It's going to draw you a graph of what happens to the relative error. Here's the error decreasing. And you can see over here, we're reducing a lot of error um, as we increase the number of nodes. Over here then flattens out, and they actually give you a cutoff point. So right here is about where we want to be. Now, you can use that. Um, but again, please use your judgment as well. And you'll see this with a lot of these methods where there's standard ways to set your parameters, uh, to set the complexity, um, but we don't want to go away from interpreting what's happening in the environment either. All right. Um, okay, so then to do prediction. Oops. Very similar to what we've done before. Uh, first, I'm going to see what my tree looks like. Just want to make sure I don't do one that's 
whoops, oh, okay, there's something else I want to do too. So one of the things I need to warn you is that if you do a large CP or if you don't have a lot of data, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll end up with one of these trees that just has a root. And if you go right back into plotting, the plot will give you um, errors, okay? And the errors don't necessarily make sense, okay? So with trees, we tend to plot them pretty quickly. There's a better error if it is not a tree, just a root. Okay, so we've just got one node, can't really plot it. Okay, so just know that about CP, that you got some error messages. Uh, we're looking, doing something up around that. Uh, that's interesting. I went ahead and paused and cleaned everything out and restarted everything because I'm not sure what was happening with those margins. Um, but I now have a tree that's working again. Um, anyway, so now you can go ahead and do a prediction. Prediction, very similar to what we've done in the past. You give it the model, your data, um, either new or existing data, and then classification for the type. That'll give you the prediction, create a new data frame, and write it to a file. Okay, so that's all the same. Now, because we're working with categorical data, there's another step that we can take to look at how well it's doing with our prediction. Um, and this uses a function called covariant co confusion matrix, sorry. And I've already copied and pasted this over. And you can see that to make this work, we create a table from the prediction and from our common name, and then we write that out to results. I'm gonna load that up in Excel. Um, you can print it here, but eek, uh, you know, it's just hard to see what's going on. Now, what this will give you is this will give you um, prevalence, specificity, uh, sensitivity. And if you're a remote sensing person or you've worked with these statistics in the past, you may want to use those. Um, however, I'm just going to bring this up in Excel and kind of show you what's happening. So, a confusion matrix shows you... Um, how many matches were correctly predicted. In other words, if you take a look, here's blue oak and blue oak. Great, so it did pretty well with blue oak. However, blue oak was confused with these other species. In other words, um, it looks like blue oak is being predicted where there's um, other species, including this California live oak. So that kind of makes sense that blue oak and California live oak would be um, confused and if we keep going you'll see there's other ones that get confused let's find something like Doug fur so there's Doug fur and as you remember the model didn't actually have a lot of these other species right there were small numbers of them so there weren't many predicted but here's Doug fur 600 correctly predicted now <clears throat> one of the reasons I point this out is because if you take a look at something like this it may become fairly obvious fairly quickly that maybe we're just trying to predict too many different uh, species. So we need to reduce the number of species, particularly those that there's almost no entries for it. Why are they even here? We should just delete those and that'll simplify things. Uh, I won't necessarily make our tree simpler, but make analyzing this simpler. And then we also may want to take a look at doing a different approach. In other words, we may want to go with things like, well, let's just do oaks. Uh, maybe we do things at the genus level instead of at the species level. That will simplify our tree and increase the accuracy of our model. All right, have fun.